So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to another uh, DCMB CCMB seminar series talk. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jinping Fu, um, who's joining us from the. Uh, he's actually multiple departments, but your your main tenure home is me mechanical engineering, but is also um, a faculty in biomedical engineering and cell and developmental biology. So that's quite a, a, a diverse portfolio there, and um, uh, should be a really interesting talk. So please take it away. So uh, thank you for having me here. And as as you know, as you can see from my affiliations, indeed, uh, my my home department is mechanical engineering department, but we work on diverse topics. And today I'm going to talk about really the topic I'm most passionate about is really mechanical biology and how it associates with human proposal stem cells. So as you can see, I'm affiliated with biomedical engineering as well as cell developmental biology. In fact, I'm also associate director uh, with the Michigan Center for Integrated Research in Critical Care, where we're teaming up with, for example, clinical doctors to develop diagnostic tools and for, for example, different clinical applications. So that's another part of my research, but that's not the part I'm going to talk about today. Again, we're going to, uh, I'm going to talk about mechanical biology of human proponent stem cells, and this is the part I'm most passionate about. So human proponent stem cells, or specifically uh, human embryo stem cells, for example, and how we derive human embryo stem cells, you have fertilized egg from in vitro fertilization. People donate their, uh, well, they will donate the fertilized egg, and then the fertilized egg will divide, then eventually by day five, you have this, this structure where people can isolate, for example, cells, individual cells from the inner cell mass, and they can culture, develop cultural methods, they can propagate this, what's now they call human embryo stem cells in vitro, they can propagate and they can culture them, and people develop different tools and methods, they can differentiate them into different cell types. People realize that they have different cell functions and mimicking, for example, the cells in the body, and different cells will have many different type of applications, for example, for cell transplantation, and now people are very excited for drug screening and toxicological screening, and more importantly, we're excited about is using human embryo stem cells to model human early embryo development. Uh, that's what we are passionate about. And of course, different cell types uh, have very different type of, uh, many different type of applications in, involved. For example, if you can derive the human proponent stem cells towards, for example, motor neurons, can use motor neurons for either drug screening to identify soluble factors or small molecule compounds and to treating, for example, diseases like ALS, right, or Parkinson's disease. Or if you have, for example, diabetes, can you derive pancreas cells for this type of treatment? Um, so going back to the, the topic I want to cover, mechanobiology, what is really a mechanobiology? Mechanobiology, I, I, as I put down here, mechanobiology is an emerging field of science as the interface of biology and and engineering. It focuses on the way the physical forces and changes in the cell and tissue mechanical environment, how they contribute to the development and physiology and disease. As a cartoon, I have put a very simple cartoon here. You're thinking about it's a single cell and adhering single cell. And when the adhering single cell attach themselves to the environment, the extracellular space, right, they can attach themselves to the extracellular matrices through what we call focal cohesions here, adhesion structures and mediated by transmembrane, trans, uh, transmembrane integrin receptors, and uh, they're experiencing the mechanical forces, the factors in the, uh, in the extracellular environment, and in addition to the soluble factors. So in the past, or conventionally biologists, they are mainly focusing on identifying, for example, the soluble factors when they bind to the receptors that leads, leads to intracellular signaling transduction uh, pathways that mediate cell behaviors. But now, these days, over the last I would say 10, 20 years, people realize more and more the importance of physical signal. So we're talking about the physical signals, including, for example, the shear stress, the shear flow, right, the cells exposed to. We always know that there's interstitial flow, and we also know the blood flow is important, for example, to maintain the endocytic cell air physiology. And also, it turns out, for example, many cells, they're regularly experiencing stretching forces. And you have the force transmitted to the cells and mediate cell function. So for us, mechanobiology, we are interested in mechanobiology of human proponent stem cells. Here, I would like to define our research here. And I want, we want to answer a few, uh, like we want to investigate a few questions we are most interested about. Are human proponent stem cells mechanosensitive? And if so, can we leverage the mechanosensitive properties of human proponent stem cells, for example, to achieve large-scale efficient production of human proponent stem cells 
or their functional derivative or functional microtissues and organoids for regenerative medicine disease modeling and drug toxicological screening. And what are the implications of human proposing stem cell in chemical biology for early, their implications for early human embryonic development, disease, and aging? So through this talk, I will provide you some experimental evidence and uh, hopefully can provide some answers or hints for some of the answers, uh, for, for some of the questions here. Not necessarily we have a complete answer for all of them, but I think we have some positive results suggesting mechanical biology is important in human proposing stem cell. So before I talk about the, the real data, the, the experimental results related to human proposing stem cells, I want to use a few slides to give you some background introduction about the tools we have developed over the last few years where we can really precisely modulate the mechanical signals the human propellant stem cell can be experienced. Or we can use these mechanical tools to precisely modulate the physical signals in the cell culture. And so the first tool I want to talk about, this is what we call micropulse array. It's a very simple concept. You have this micropulse array, it's like a copy of pillars, right? And these pillars, they have the same diameter, and we can modulate the height very precisely. So when you have cells, again, adherent cells see the on, on top of the micropulse array, if the pulse is very short, it's like stunt, the cell will exert force on the pulse. As you can see from the cartoon here, or the SEM, uh, I will, I'll talk about this later. The cells will exert force on the surface. It's a way for them, in fact, to probe the mechanical environment. So when the pulse is short, it's very difficult for the cells to bend. So they feel this is a rigid surface. But when the pulse becomes very tall, it's easy for, them, for the cell to bend. So this is a soft pulse. So effectively, we are controlling the mechanical rigidity of the surface the cells are experiencing. So more recently, we're adding, we're integrating the micropulse array onto a stretchable membrane. So now we can stretch the underlying membrane in such a way that we are applying active forces to the cells. So therefore, we are adding an active component to the cell. So as you can see the cartoon here, of course, a zoom-in picture showing the cells make attachment to the underlying pulse, again, through focal adhesions. So one thing I want to note here, and if you're not familiar with the actin cytoskeleton structure, the actin cytoskeleton, uh, actin cytoskeleton structures, they're connecting themselves and to the extracellular space through focal adhesions. So this is what we call mechanical continuum. Thinking about the mechanical, uh, the, the, the extracellular space, extracellular matrices, and they get connected to focal adhesion, and then focal adhesion get connected to the cytoskeleton. So this is what we call as a mechanical continuum, uh, connecting the cells from extracellular space up to, in fact, the nucleus. So now we are using these tools to study, for example, the human proponent stem cell behavior. As you can see, this is a very high resolution SEM scanning electron microscopy image showing a single stem cell. You can see seated on top of the micropose. You see the drastic bending of the underlying pose. The cells definitely are exerting a lot of force uh, on, the, on, uh, on the matrices. So, in fact, using microfabrication, that's really uh, uh, something we're very comfortable with, and we can develop different tools using microfabrication. And in fact, we can generate very many, many different type of uh, different types of micropose. You can see. Let's focus on the uh, the SCM scanning electron microscope uh, images here. You can see the pose, the top two pose here, the center to center distance four micron. The diameter of the pose is 1.8 micron, and we can modulate the height very precisely from sub micron up to maybe. 15, 15 micron. And then the bottom two SEM images showing the pose, 0.8 micron pose, and center to center distance, 2 micron. And again, we can modulate the height very precisely. Going back to, in fact, if you have any engineering background, you should know that we can easily calculate the spring constant, right? This is almost like a, a pillar, it's a, like a spring. You can easily calculate the spring constant of the pillars using this uh, simple expression. It's the capital K here. Uh, you applying this Ola Bernoulli equation, we can calculate the spring constant. It's proportional to the force power of the diameter of the pulse, and inversely proportional to the uh, cubic of the pulse height. So you can imagine that by modulating the height by tenfold, right, from one micron up to ten micron, you effectively get thousandfold difference in the spring constant. And not to mention that you can modulate the diameter as well. That's what we did here. So really give you a broad range of spring constant where you can manipulate and you can try to observe whether the rigidity of the micropose will exert effect on stem cell behaviors. So more recently, we can also, for example, we can, again, use microfabrication, even spatially pattern the rigidity so that you can see that in this region, the post, the base of the post rises up. So 
So you can see the post, the tops of the post, they remain on the same surface. So effectively, we can spatially pattern the mechanical signal. So people are interested, for example, to study how such gradient of uh, mechanical signals can mediate, for example, directed cell migration, just like camel taxes, right? Cells, they sense the chemical gradient, they migrate. And in fact, it turns out many, many mechanosensitive adherent cells, they sense the mechanical rigidity gradient, they will migrate and have directional migration. To make our tools, in fact, compatible, or con uh, compatible with conventional cell biology studies, in fact, we can really generate very large arrays uh, like we can in fact transfer the ge geometries and from silicon mode to, for example, this is 100 millimeter tissue culture dish, and really we can culture a large amount of cells to make our tools very consistent or very compatible with conventional cell biology study. So as I mentioned, more recently we're integrating the micropose array onto a stretchable membrane. The concept is very simple. You have this, we have this gadget where we have this vacuum chamber, and the, the post is integrated on, onto the center of the membrane. And then we, when we activate the vacuum, then the periphery of the membrane got sucked into the chamber. Therefore, the center region got equally boxed with trash. Therefore, the centers, in the center, the cell seated on top of the micropose got equally boxed with trash. So the two face images here, you can clearly see that, right? The center to center distance, four micron before stretch. And right after stretch, you can see, easily see the increase the center to center distance between the posts. And one critical difference, and I'm assuming some of you know that people, people also use, for example, you can thinking about, you can continuously, or you can culture the cells on a continuous membrane without post, and you can stretch the membrane as a way to stretch the cells. But in fact, it's quite different from our system. Let me explain here. So when you stretch, in fact, in our system, when you stretch the membrane, the strain, the deformation of the membrane, in fact, does not propagate up the post. In reality, the top surface, the top geometry of the post does not change. That's what you can see from, in fact, the, even the face images here at the top, the geometry, you can see the square, the circles, they don't change, in fact. We're really just applying a force. We are not straining the full cohesion directly. That's a critical difference from our system versus conventional system. So a critical question we are very interested, in fact, over the last few years, is to apply the system to study force media full cohesion dynamics. As I mentioned, that full cohesions are the cells, the adhesion structure the cells use to attach themselves to the surface. Is mediated by transmembrane integrin receptors, right? Here we're using, for example, a fiber bus cell line expressing, stably expressing YP tax taxidin. Taxidin is a full cohesion protein, therefore allow us to study in situ full cohesion dynamics. So before stretch, you can see this is a live cell assay. You can see individual green dots here, those are full cohesions, right? You can see the green dots, in fact, they're re regularly positioned. In, in fact, you can, we can easily see that you have one full cohesion on one post, which is not surprising. So one minute after 12% static stretch, we stretch the membrane, then we hold it, right? So it's a static stretch. So you can see one minute after, you can see drastic changes. So very obvious. So the full cohesions, they become brighter, or the GAP signal become brighter and bigger. So there's significant, almost instantaneous reinforcement of the full cohesion and to respond as a response for the cells to such a stretch perturbation. So in fact, in addition to monitor, so now in fact we have a few things we can monitor in this experimental platform. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slides, we can monitor for first the full cohesion, right, their dynamic response, the intensity and size. In fact, I didn't mention that, in fact, the post itself is a very useful tool for us to monitor, to report the force, the overall force cell exert on the substrate, because we can easily map out the bending diffraction through so uh, fluorescent microscopy. So therefore, we have the force, Right, that's the cell exerted on the substrate. Then we have the full cohesions, that's individual full cohesions, individual green dots. In fact, if we co express, if the cells are co-expressing, for example, the GAP or IP, IP actin, you can even see the individual, individual actin fibers. So again, as I was mentioning in one of the slides, you can imagine that you have this continuous mechanic, mechanic, uh, mechanical continuum, right? From extracellular space, full cohesion, up to the actin stress fibers. In fact, in our system, we can, we can establish this mechanical continuum in a very spatially registered manner. You have individual full cohesion connected to individual stress fibers, and we can report the traction force exerted by the cell. So this is a very nice tool, in fact, to study force, force media full cohesion dynamics as well as signaling. All right, 
uh, I, will, I will escape this slide. In fact, using this platform, in addition to study force media for cohesion, in fact, we can, we can even map out the cell stiffness. Cell stiffness, you can imagine that you see the cells on top of substrate, they exert force. But at the same time, people are also interested how stiff and soft the, cell, it, uh, the cells are. For example, there's a lot of recent studies identify the stiffness of the cell as a mechanical phenotype of cells. In fact, they are people have data showing that they have significant correlations with, for example, if the cells are cancer cells, they are metast metastatic states. So uh, I'm not going through uh, the, the details here, but we can use this tools to map out as the sub uh, subcellular level uh, single cell stiffness. So more recently, through collaboration with our collaborator, uh, Dr. Sherry Den at the BME department here, uh, Dr. Sherry Den, she's an expert using lipid microbubbles to, for, for example, drug delivery, right? Non-virus-based gene delivery. And if you're familiar with sound operation, it's a method where people use a lipid microbubble. And when the lipid microbubble, under stimulation with ultrasound, the lipid microbubble, let's take a look at the cartoon here. So if you have a lipid microbubble and the are under the stimulation with ultrasound, the lipid microbubble normally will rapidly contract and expand. Uh, again, this, in fact, this is gas bubble. So such rapid dynamics of bubble expansion and contraction will lead to a significant shear stress, in fact, near the bubble. That shear stress will normally, can generate a change in pore on the membrane, cell membrane. So that leads to non-virus-based drug delivery. But in our case, we we're wondering whether we can use, explore the interactions between ultrasound and the lipid microbubbles and for mechanobiology study. It turns out, in fact, under ultrasound stimulation, there's also another component that has not been fully exploited in the past. This is what we call acoustic radiation force. Through so momentum transfer between ultrasound and the bubble, in fact, you can exert a directional force on the bubble so that you can manipulate the bubble movement, right? In fact, once we highlight, in fact, if we function the lipid microbubbles with, for example, this is zoom in picture now, with, for example, RGD peptides that can be recognized by cell surface receptors. So we can bind the, uh, we can bind the lipid microbubbles to the cell surface. So then on the ultrasound stimulation, you can manipulate the ultrasound direction. So you can, in fact, you can manipulate the displacement of the lipid microbubbles. I'll show you a video here. You can see this is a single cell and see it on top of the micropose. The bright spots here, those are underlying posts. So you can see the black spots here, that's the lipid microbubble. So after we activate the ultrasound, you can see the lateral displacement. You can see the lateral displacement of the lipid microbubble. So indeed, we can almost, re this is a new way we can apply a local force to the cell. So this is very compatible, in fact, if you're familiar with optical tweezer or magnetic tweezer, right? People can attach some polystyrene beads to the cells and by manipulating the bead dislocation uh, displacement, you can apply a force to the cells. So now we can really apply the cell, uh, a local force to the cells. Let's focus on one key data here. That's the reason I included here. In fact, I'm not sure if you can read, careful, uh, read, uh, read clearly. Even by applying ultrasound for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, that's the data shows here. So we apply the ultrasound as t equals zero. You can see only even 10 seconds or 20 seconds stimulation with the ultrasound you can see sustained increase of the cells in terms of their contractile force. So the cells are experiencing 10 second or 20 second stimulation with this, what we call a cost treasury cytometry, but their contractile force will continue to increase for more than 30 minutes in this case. So in fact, the cells are very responsive to such a mechanical stimulation. So going back to the main topic, so mechanobiology of human proponent stem cells, now we have developed so many tools. So what are the, so the first question, as I mentioned, whether mechanobiology, or sorry, human proponent stem cells will be mechanosensitive or not. In fact, of course, there's so many different questions you can study. And as I mentioned, um, people are always interested to differentiate human proponent stem cells towards different type of cells, different type of neurons, right, for example. And in fact, we have to choose a system to study, to demonstrate, or to probe our question. So then we decided to, let's, let's focus on neurogenic differentiation from human proponent stem cells. We all know that from developmental biology studies, people already, developmental biology have that identified many, many soluble factors and what people call morphogens and identify their importance in mediating or dictating in what's, in which part of your, 
in which part of your body or brain and you will have the, uh, the, the right type of neurons, right? Why they show up in the right place in the right time? That's the, uh, that's the type of questions people are most interested. So for example, if you take a look at cartoon here, it's a very simple sketch. And this is a, a, a neuron tissue, and you have forebrain, middle brain, hem brain, and the spinal cord. So people identify, for example, as I mentioned, that the importance of soluble factors, in this case, retinic acid. RA, that's the retinic acid. Very important, one of the most important soluble factors. And dictating, for example, uh, what we call anterior posterior patterning, right? Establishing this axis. So this is forebrain, this is spinal cord. So you have this anterior posterior patterning, this axis establishment. And of course, if you take cross section of each tissue, in fact, within each tissue, you can see that you have different type of neurons, or certain type of neurons will local, be localized in a certain region of the tissue. For example, in for motor neurons, people know that the position of the motor neurons in the spinal cord is dictated also by soluble factor called the sonic hedgehog. You see another soluble factor gradient, right? Again, people identify many, many different soluble factors. And identifying, or like following such knowledge from developmental biologists, developmental biology studies, stem cell biologists start to develop in vitro culture systems, right? From human proposing stem cells, if you want to develop, for example, culture protocols to obtain, for example, motor neurons, so the first step, then you, you treat the cells with certain chemicals to drive the cells towards, for example, what we call neuron, neuron abscidic cells. It's, it's type of, you can, uh, progenitor cells, progenitor stem cells. Then afterwards, you can start to add different soluble factors, in this case, rationic acid and sonic, uh, sonic hedgehog, to drive the neuron abscidic cells, the, the stem cells, the progenitor cells towards, for example, the, the, uh, uh, the spinal cord progenitor cells. Then you add more soluble factors, many, many more, and eventually they become functional motor neurons. And the problem with such conventional stem cell studies, in fact, you take a look at the timeline here, it takes, not to mention weeks, it's sometimes months, long time for you to culture or differentiate the embryonic stem cells towards functional cells at the end to show really real function, which is not surprising because many, it turns out many human embryonic stem cells, they follow their uh, developmental principles they, they need to follow, right? And uh, so at the end, the problem, first, it's very time consuming to derive, uh, derive function cells. And at the end, you realize that also the efficiency and the yield is extremely low, as I will show you the data. At the end, you get a, a, almost like less than 10% yield, right? Even the purity. So not necessarily very useful. So we are ask, asking the question, can we improve this process? What, if Human proposing stem cells, they are mechanical sensitive. Can we improve this? But of course, I highlighted human proposing stem cells, like the motor neurons here, and I also, motor neurons are important, right? Uh, they are associated with the de degenerative muscle disease, ALS. These are the two famous patients associated with one unfortunate passed away, and uh, because of the disease, and one is Stephen Hawking, is one of arguably the most famous physicist. And he's lucky enough, he's still living right now. Um, all right, so going back to the, uh, 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 the discussion here. So we borrow to establish, to identify whether human proponent stem cells are mechanical sensitive or not. We borrow a protocol established very recently. In fact, this is a protocol published in Nature Biotech in 2009. People identify two soluble factors. One is PGA beta inhibitor, the other one is BNT4 inhibitor. Once you add these two inhibitors into your culture, you effectively can drive the human embryonic stem cells to differentiate towards neural abscidic cells. So this is the protocol established in this publication. So we simply borrow this protocol, but we want to repeat the assays so that on our microposter arrays with different rigidity. Let's take a look at the simple question whether rigidity can affect this process. It turns out the answer is yes. And the results, in fact, is very, uh, uh, very impressive. So let's take a look at the data here. We're comparing, in fact, we use a very soft microposter array. This is one kilopascal, and the rigid one is about 1,000 kilopascal. We use the glass as a positive, uh, as a rigid control. So with the two inhibitors, you can see drastic difference in terms of the PAC6 staining here. That's the, the staining uh, associated with neuroabsidic cells. In fact, most of cells as after day A uh, become PAC6 positive neuroabsidic cells. But in distinct contrast, so you can see rigid and glasses, many of cells are AP2 positive neuroquest cells. So this is basically a byproduct in this uh, protocol. So this is the quantified results, in fact. 
by day A, as, as you can see from the staining results, indeed, so the PAC6 positive neural abscitic cells, almost you get 100% PAC6 positive neural abscitic cells. And in contrast, it's about like uh, close to 30, 35% uh, on rigid surfaces. And we start to see PAC6 positive cells as early as day four. And so this is the Western block uh, to confirm the ex protein expression levels for, for PAC6 and SOX1. Again, confirming that the soft substrate promoting the neural abscitic cell differentiation from human proponent stem cells. One thing I may, uh, I, I didn't mention here, there's also very interesting observation here. If you remove the LDN, that's the DMP4 inhibitor, from the culture, you can see that regardless of the substrate mechanics, all the, almost all the differentiation get pushed away from your abscissal cell differentiation. They are more towards, they become more towards, biased towards your crest cell differentiation. This is very interesting, in fact, because this identified, this suggests that the BMP4 mediates mass signaling likely get involved in this mechanosensitive uh, behaviors of human proponent stem cells. So the quantified results are here. So you can see that this is a percentage of uh, pack, uh, positive cells. So for AP2, you can see when we remove the LDN, majority of cells become AP2 positive in our crest cell. So this is very interesting. And in fact, indeed, we have mechanistic data suggesting that mass signaling is involved in this process. So we further perform uh, real-time PCR to further confirm the gene expression of human proponent stem cells. And so in the previous slides, I mentioned that. So we, we basically use the very rigid versus the very soft, one kilopascal versus 1,000 kilopascal. So in fact, then we decide, let's take a look of add more conditions, rigidity conditions to the assay so that let's take a look if, if there's any interesting finding. It turns out, in this case, you can see we added a few more rigidity conditions. And we stain the cells for PAC6 as day two, day four, day six, and day eight. And even from the staining images, you can see as this within the range we tested here, it seems like this is the quantified results. Uh, y axis here or z axis here is percentage of PAC6 positive cells as function of culture time and the substrate mechanics. It seems like there's a threshold between 5 kilopascal and 14 kilopascal. Below this threshold, it seems like rigidity has the softness has drastic effect promoting neural abscitic cell differentiation. So we further confirm our experiment using induced proponent stem cells. This is a cell line uh, 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 obtained from our collaborator, Paul Kressback, uh, at the University of Michigan. And this is the induced, uh, the induced proponent stem cells are derived from human uh, uh, skin fiber bar. And again, you see similar behavior. The soft substrate will promote neural abscitic cell differentiation. So another key experiment we, we demonstrated. So as I mentioned in one of the early slides, so the first step is you drive human proponent stem cells towards neural abscitic cells. Then you have to give the cues to the neural abscitic cells so that it becomes differentiated towards neurons that have specific identities. You have to give them some patterning cues so that they become either neurons associated with forebrain, for example, or neurons associated with spinal cord. In this case, in fact, we, this is the uh, acid protocol we, 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 we uh, devised. So the first four days, we used these two inhibitors. Then after four days of culture, we are adding rationic acid to the culture. Again, rationic acid is a, a soluble factor that will drive, effectively will drive the cells become posterior identity cells. That's the cells, for example, associated with spinal cord. So by day A, we, let's take a look at the expression levels for these markers. OTX2 is the anterior marker. It's a transcription factor associated with anterior uh, neurons. And Hox genes, these are very important and people, uh, very important, very specific markers associated with posterior, uh, posterior neurons. So by day A, let's take a look at this, the quantified results of real-time PCR. You can see that without rationic acid, you can see drastic enhanced expression for the Hox gene without rationic acid. Even with rationic acid, that's the soluble factor. And you can see uh, improvement, uh, enhanced, uh, enhancement for the Hox D4 and Hox D8. So we further perform uh, the immunostaining to confirm the protein expression levels for, uh, uh, for OTX2 and the Hox, Hox D4 and the comparing rigid and uh, soft conditions, you can see indeed confirming that. In addition to the fact that soft substrate will promote the human proponent stem cells to differentiate towards new abscitic cells, it turns out that soft substrate will promote the differentiation for the new abscitic cells or neurons associated with posterior identity. It has some Ident uh, the soft substrate would direct neural patterning towards posterior identity. 
So we further learn to get a functional motor neurons, you have to, again, you have to add more factors, unfortunately. So we really, we have to extend the assay towards now day 23. By day 23, we start to, we can stain the cells for HB9, and then by day 30, we can stain the cells for other markers. Let's just focus on the data uh, we obtained from day 23. That's the marker uh, we use HB9 as a very specific transcription factor associated with motor neurons. In fact, that's the only marker uh, biologists believe that can specifically identify motor neurons. So HB9, this is the percentage of HB9 cells we obtain from our cell culture after 23 days of culture. You can see almost fourfold improvement uh, in terms of culture. So this is the percentage of cells, basically is the purity of the cells you are getting, the motor neurons. More importantly, if we plot, this is the normalized HB9 cells, and we get more than tenfold improvement. So this is the normalized cell number. That's indicate this is the yield, how many cells you are getting from your cell culture. So there's a tenfold improvement. So nonetheless, so the motor neurons, of course, with through collaboration, we have to use perform conventional uh, single cell like a uh, catch plant, uh, catch plant, catch clamp, catch clamp assays to further confirm they are indeed functional. Indeed, we perform many assays. Um, so. As I mentioned that in one of the, the first slides, I mentioned that when we remove the BMP4 inhibitor, it turns out that we are driving all the cells towards you know, crest cells. That's suggesting that BMP4 media mass signaling likely is involved. It turns out that before we start to thinking about the mechanistic picture underlying the mechanosensitive behaviors of human performance stem cells, we notice very two prominent papers. So the first paper, in fact, that's published in Nature Cell Biology in 2008, identified the importance of yet pads as a cofactor that binds to, is, uh, are required for somatic translocation to the nucleus in human performance stem cells. And second, that's basically this is the cartoon shown here. So you have SMAT and phosphor SMAT translocate to the nucleus, right, to mediate downstream gene expression. It turns out this translocation requires binding to YEP. It turns out when you knock down YEP paths, so that's the data here, when you use sRNA to knock down paths, that's the red bar here, you see just improvement increase of the PAC6 positive cells. That's the neural absolute cells we'll talk about, right? So, uh, all right, that's the information uh, we obtained from this paper. And second, there's a, a very prominent paper published in Nature in 2010. This is the one of the most dis uh, important discovery in mechanical biology over the last, I would say, 10 years. Identify if PADs themselves are nuclear transducers involved in regulating mechanical sensitive properties of adult mammalian cells. Oh, in this previous studies, they, they, they have not examined human proponent stem cells. It turns out, let's take a look at the data here. When they culture the cells on soft versus rigid conditions, you can see the staining here. This is soft condition, this is rigid condition. You can see on rigid surfaces, the cells, the yet pads, they localize in the nucleus. But on soft substrates, they're very diffusive. They, they're primarily localized in the cytoplasm, right, cytosol. So this is the quantified result. So identify yep paths as very important mechanical transducers, um, mechanical transducers and uh, involved in human uh, uh, adult mammalian cells. So our hypothesis is yep paths mediate nuclear accumulation of SMAS to regulate rigidity dependent neural induction of human proponent stem cells. So again, the physical picture is here. So we know that from this study that phosphor phosphorus mass they translocate to the nucleus and requires binding of yep. It also turns out that YEP is very important downstream effector involved in HIPPO signal, it turns out. Uh, I'll provide more information uh, about the HIPPO signal in my following slide. So therefore, let's, let's take a look of whether, first experiment, whether rigidity will have effect to mediate mass signaling. So the first experiment is rather straightforward. We perform Western block. Let's take a look of phosphorus mass. Right, that's the SMAT signal. And you can see, indeed, which surfaces will promote SMAT phosphorylation, right? And, well, that's great. Let's take a look of YAP. And indeed, the inhuman embryonic stem cells, again, all the assays are performed in human embryonic stem cells. So you can see that day, day zero, and basically this is 24 hours after seeding the cells on the, on, on the substrate. You can see that on which surfaces, indeed, the YAP will, will localize, concentrate themselves in the nucleus. And well, in contrast, uh, they were localized in the cytosol uh, for the cells on the soft substrate, on the soft, uh, soft substrate. So this is the percentage of nuclear yet. And again, confirming that 
at least quantified results obtained from the standing images, the cells, uh, the yep tests, they, in, for cells see the on rigid surfaces, they localize in the nucleus, and but for cells on the soft surfaces, they localize in the cytosol. And this is the Western plot, and where we obtain, we extract proteins, the protein fractions, uh, the nuclear protein fractions and cytosol protein fractions. Again, confirming that on for for cells seeded on soft substrate, they localize in, for example, if pre, uh, prefer to localize in the uh, in the cytosol, and the, you can see also co-localization of yep with SMAP. And same thing, uh, in contrast, for the cells seeded on rigid surfaces, yep prefer to localize in the nucleus. Again, you can see the co-localization of yep with SMAP, which is consistent uh, with prior study. So that's the first experiment. And also, let's think about yep how rigidity, we know that YEP can control SMAP translocation, but then the question is, how mechanics regulate YEP activity, right? And what's the mechanism? It turns out YEP, again, as I mentioned, that is a very important downstream effector involved in hippo signaling. In hippo signaling, in fact, upstream of YEP, there's a very important kinase, it's called LAS, and this LAS can phosphor YEP. And phosphor YEP binds to another scaffold protein, protein-33, and make the phosphor YEP unavailable to inhibit YEP activities. This is one of the most important mechanisms involved in HIPPO regulation. It turns out, let's take a look of, then we decide to, let's take a look of the importance of YEP and LAS. So it, it, we, we perform the Western blot. Let's take a look of whether soft substrate and rigidity can mediate YEP phosphorylation. This is the most important uh, side, uh, downstream of uh, LAS, uh, this, this particular uh, phosphorylation site. You can see the upper regulation of YEP phosphorylation, and then we perform, more importantly, we use SNA, use LAS SNA to knock down LAS, and you can see, indeed, we can knock down LAS, and once we knock down LAS, uh, as expected, you can see down regulation of, of uh, this phosphory YEP, and more importantly, when we use this SNA to treat the cells, uh, this, this SNA treated treat cells, when we perform the same assay for the differentiation, you can see drastic uh, suppression of the mechanics effect. So this is the quantified results. You can see when we knock down last, you basically don't see this rigidity effect in promoting the neural absolute cell differentiation. So effectively, so it turns out there's some way that when you see the cells on soft substrate, LATS get activated. We still don't know why, but LATS get activated and phosphory YEP. And then YEP, phosphory YEP get bind to another protein and make them unavailable to mediate translocation of phosphorus SMAP. So basically this is a very simple, I have, we, we have more data, but this is a very simple picture now and after the discussion. So indicating how rigidity mediate the neural absolute cell differentiation. We have rigid surfaces then the LAS, for some reason, not activated. And uh, you can see I, I kind of hinted that LAS binds to actin fibers. It turns out LAS is an actin binding protein. But again, this is a hypothesis. So on rich surfaces, you have actin stress fibers, and LAS bind to actin stress fibers, making them unavailable to phosphorate YEP. So YEP can bind to SMAP, phosphorate SMAP, to transfer, uh, transfer phosphorate SMAP to the nucleus. But then, in fact, this becomes promoting the cells, embryonic stem cells, their self-renewal program. But when you have soft substrate, then the diffusive actin structures and promoting the LAS, uh, their, their activation, and then uh, phosphor YEP, and make them unavailable to trans translocate uh, the phosphorus map. And of course, as we, one of the data suggests that the soft substrates, it turns out that it also can inhibit SMAP phosphorylation as well. So this is what we call multi-targeted mechanotransductive mechanisms involving many, many different players, right? Which is not surprising, in fact. When we're talking about mechanobiology, it's never a sing single pathway or never a single player, molecular player. In this case, you can see many, many different players. There's a HIPPO pathway, there's a SMAP phosphorylation, and right, downstream DNT signal. So let's go to the next, uh, the, 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 the last part of my talk, uh, so maybe I have five to 10 minutes, I guess. Maybe five minutes. So this is really the modeling part. 
as I indicate in my title, I call the title of my talk is mechanical control, mechanical control and modeling, right, of human performance stem cells. I think of my talk, the my private slides, that's the control part. Now let's talk about the modeling part. But the modeling part I'm talking about here is not necessarily computational modeling. No, it's different. I'm not a computational person. So now we are talking about using human performance stem cells to model human early embryo development. Right? Can we develop model systems to study embryo development? So one specific step, very critical in human performance stem cell development, is neuroration. So you can think about by week three, right? Week three, after gastration, you all know that gastration, you have three different germ layers: ectoderm, endoderm, uh, or ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And between the week three and week four, week four, then this neuration will happen. Between this week three and week four, some magic will happen. And with some magic will happen. So this three gen layers. Then there's this, what we call like neural plate will develop, right? You can see the cartoon here. That's neural plate will develop. Neural ectoderm tissue will develop. You have this neural ectoderm in the middle. Then you have this, you have this neural crest as the border. And then you have this non-neural ectoderm, that's basically epidermis, right? And eventually, this neural ectoderm will fold and form the neural tube. Of course, neural tube is very important. It forms your brain, forms the, the, uh, the spinal cord, right? Of course, any dysregulation of this process leads to, for example, birth defect, right? This is a, this is a spine, spinal bifida. That's, uh, that's not, not necessarily uh, uh, lethal. But there's some other more, some other stuff. But anyway, so some magic will happen. But development biologists identify the importance of BMP signaling, right? Many, many soluble factors and the morphogens, their gradients. Uh, BMP signaling, it turns out, is one of them. Let's take a look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the sketch here. So people identify the importance of BMP signaling. People believe that the gradient of BMP signaling will mediate, will regulate this neural actor during tissue formation. So people identify that, believe that the high BMP signaling will lead to, for example, epidermic cell, the neural ectoderm or non-neural ectoderm tissue, and then low BMP signaling will lead to the middle part, that's the neural plate, and somewhere in the middle, people think that that will lead to neural crest cell. Of course, you can easily argue that well, people tend to develop simple theories that explain things. Uh, it turns out, indeed, but also people observe that from developmental biologists' uh, studies. In fact, in early embryo development, there's many, many mechanical factors involved, right? Cells move like crazy, they, re they rearrange themselves, form tissues, fold, and form cavities. There's many, many mechanical factors, which is, right? This is the best example, in fact, is the neural tube closure as one of the example. In fact, as the label uh, title suggests here, in fact, it's a biomechanical process. So now the question is, can we model this, this process? It turns out, indeed, we can. In fact, it's, uh, it's also, in fact, you can see when we patent, uh, again, we use the same protocol, in fact, uh, as we published, uh, as we've shown, uh, use the two inhibitors here. The, uh, so effectively, we can drive, as you remember, we can drive the neural absolute, uh, the human proposed stem cells towards neural crest cells or neural absolute cells. Then always you have this byproduct, as I was mentioning, neural crest cells as a byproduct in the cartoon. In fact, it turns out that if we culture the cells, but in this case, we are culture the cells in a colony. So we find a way there where we can control the cell will grow in a, for example, spherical, like circular colony. So this is a, on a two-dimensional surface, right? By time, oh, sorry, let's take a look up here. So by day nine, you can see the face image, right? The cells form a very nice colony. It turns out even on the face microscope, you can see almost like a two cell Population, two population of cells. The cells in the center, they are definitely more closely packed together, and the cells on the periphery, they are more, more loosely connected, and they, 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 they're more loosely connected. Then, of course, we stain the cells, and we use PAC3, this is, again, neural crest cell marker, and then PAC6, SIG1 and MSX1, these are the, oh, sorry, PAC6 is the neural, neural absolute cell uh, marker, and PAC3 and ZIC1 and MXX1 is a neural crest marker. So you can see the heat maps here. The PAC6 positive neural absolute cells, they concentrate in the center. 
and then PAX3 positive or uh, SIG1 and MSX1 positive neural crest cells, they will prefer to localize on the colony, on the periphery of the colony. Right? We further perform a live cell assay. In fact, this is a reported cell line and uh, uh, like SOX10 EGFP cell line. And uh, SOX10, again, is a neural crest marker. So basically, if we see green signal, indicate that that's a neural crest cell by right, doing differentiation. So over time, you can see day four, day, day five, day six. By day six, you, we start to see that the green cells, those are SOX10 positive cells, they start to show as the periphery of the colony. So indeed, it's not like the cells were differentiated into neural absolute cells or neural crest cells, and then they self-segregate, right, or self-sorting. Is it turns out the cells on the periphery of the colony, they decide to become neural crest cells. The cells in the center, they decide to become neural absolute cells. So effectively, in fact, we are generating a neural actogen tissue here, where you have neural crest cells or neural absolute cells in the center and neural crest cells on the periphery. So of course, we're asking the question why this is happening. In fact, we noticed that during the differentiation, during the assay, the cells, when we see the cells, the cells are rather uniform. But over time, because this is nine day, uh, A or nine days culture, over time, the cells will, will, will start to rearrange themselves or really adjust themselves. The cells in the center become more packed. They, in fact, become more elongated. And it's very consistent with the previous picture cartoon I was showing for, uh, in developmental biology. For neuroactoderm tissue, they become elongated, the tissue. And those cells become neuroabsidic cells. Same thing happening in our culture. In fact, if we stain zero one, that's a basically allow us to, to see the cell morphology. The cells in the center definitely they smaller. And also, when we treat the cells with blob studying, which blocks contractility or the actin uh, contractility, uh, they, they become more uniform distributed. So this is the projected cell area, and as the center, uh, as center, the smaller, and the periphery they're bigger. And when we treat the cells, basically we we, we eliminate this difference. And because we can use the force, the post, to measure the force as well. In fact, it turns out that the colony, in the, within the colony, the cells on the periphery, they exert stronger forces. And again, when we use the blob studying, uh, that will block, eliminate the difference. And so when we, what's the data here? All right, so when we use blob studying, same thing happening. And, and we, when we stay in the PAX3, you can see we, we basically eliminate this spatial distribution of PAX3 positive in your crest cells. So this is the control where the PAX3 positive cells on the periphery, when we use blob studying, this will eliminate this neuroactoderm uh, tissue pattern. So then the question is, now we see that the cells on the periphery, the colony periphery, they're bigger, they exert higher force. And why, that's how that contribute to this neuroactoderm tissue formation, right? Why that leads to neuroabsidic cells in the center, neurocrest cells on the periphery? It turns out, uh, we have the data here, uh, I will explain to you. It turns out that cell morphology, cell shape, itself can mediate BMP signal. So I will explain the data here. So you can see that when we see the colony, uh, see the, the cells with low density, this is 5,000 cells per square centimeter, and this is 20,000 cells per square centimeter, and we stain the phosphorus mat. Again, this is the downstream effectors of SMAT signal. So you can see the phosphorus map primarily localized in the nucleus, identifying this is the BMP, the uh, uh, active BMP signal. But when we see that the cells with high density and the, the BMP signal get drastically reduced. So, so same thing when we uh, uh, when we use the blob studying to, uh, to treat the cells and the BMP signal get, uh, get basically in, in eliminated. To further confirm that the cell shape has drastic effect on BMP signaling. We even perform single cell assay. So where we can confine the cell area, single cell area, this is single cell assay. So this is the cell area, this is a 500 micron, square micron, and this is a 1,600 1, square micron. And you can see that the phosphorus SMAT were, uh, were localized in the nucleus. Well, in this case, in the smaller cells, the diffusive in the cytosol. So this is the quantified result. So we even perform real-time PCR and uh, comparing the low density, high seeding density versus low seeding density. Again, this is the target genes, BMP target genes, and suggesting that indeed lower seeding density leads to higher, uh, larger cell area and will promote the BMP signal or uh, SMAT activity. And this is in fact the single cell from the single cell uh, data. Again, I only present partially uh, the data suggesting that the mechanics, the cell area itself, 
can mediate BNP signal. So going back to the uh, the discussion of the uh, from the convention of developmental biology, people identify BNP signaling is important. It turns out that the mechanics provide a gating mechanism that can reinforce this BNP near signaling, right? As a control mechanism to make to make sure that the development events can properly uh, be executed in the developmental events. So I think I will stop here. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I run out of. So I will. Uh, really acknowledge uh, uh, acknowledge the students who really made this uh, 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 our research possible here. And Yu Bing is really the student who was the cornerstone in my lab uh, for human proposal stem cell. Now he's an assistant professor at UMass Amherst, um, setting up his own lab now. I have two fantastic uh, senior PhD students who are graduating soon, Sun and the Yue. So they are also uh, very important and uh, in the team. Uh, uh, performing research on human proposal stem cells. The rest of my group, they are working on some other uh, non-related research, and the results are not discussed here. So these are my collaborators, some of them as UN, some of them uh, in different institutions. These are the funding agent, uh, agencies that made our research possible. So thank you very much, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, any questions? That was a really great talk. I was interested in your data that showed how the rigidity of the substrate that the cells were growing on really promoted stemness. It seemed like stem cells like a more rigid matrix. Um, I was wondering if you had an idea about why that was and if we can take that information to get hints about where stem cells might exist within the stem cell niche in vivo. So indeed, you are right. Uh, my data is indeed. indeed I, I, it is true that it turns out that rigid surfaces is a is the right niche condition to promote human proposing stem cell their self renewal. It, it is true, and uh, so how that really can hint us. I'm trying to remember what you were you were asking. The, how that so take that information about um, the rigidity. Yes. Um, and its relationship to stemness, and try to try to parse that into information about where stem cells might exist within a tissue. Right. Oh, I see. I see. But of course, the data we have here is, it turns out, it turns out, let, let me make it more clear, it turns out that so many different stem cells, right, in the, in the adult body, there are many type of also adult stem cells. It turns out, indeed, that the mechanosensitive behaviors for adult stem cells, for example, they are cell type specific. Not necessarily the knowledge, for example, generated in our case, in human proposal stem cells, and bank stem cells can be easily translated directly to, for example, adult stem cells. In fact, when we performed the research, for example, indeed, we, we had a separate paper specifically investigating rigidity, how that affecting prepotency maintenance of human proposal stem cells. Before that study, we were hoping that we were expecting rich soft surface might promote prepotency. But it turns out it's, it's different. It's, it turns out rigid surface is better. So that's something uh, surprising to us, but it's also understandable given that, in fact, now we have a kind of idea what's the intracellular signaling pathways involved. For example, the SMAT signal, right? It's important mediating, for example, phosphoric SMAT is required, it turns out, for prepotency maintenance. And it turns out rigid surfaces is, it promotes SMAT signal, right? So there's a, so, so I, I would say that it's definitely the mechanical biology research is moving forward now people are starting to understand more the intracellular mechanisms, right? The mechanical sense, the mechanical transductive mechanisms, signal pathways involved. Then, once we really have a good understanding about the intracellular part, I think that, that would be more helpful to answer that the question you're you're asking. Yeah. Yes. One is that. Uh, What's the degree of uh, stretch, the highest degree of stretch you can do? We can almost go up to 20%. 20%, yeah. That's also like as high as you want, because we are engineers. I agree. We, we are engineers. I agree. But, but when you go, go really high, sometimes it really the cells become really unhappy, they will detach or something. But in, in practice, 20%, that's normally the limit 
beyond 20% stretch, we start to see cell, they, they become runs up, they, they detach themselves from the surface. Right. Like the downstream study is more difficult. Right. So <laughs> it um, seems like it's doing something to the, to the confirmation of the model. The confirmation of yeah, you uh, you speed up the transformation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, seems like uh, you're doing something at the molecular level. Is there any evidence for that? Molecular level, I, I guess your maybe to connect your question to the to cell stretch. Yeah, right. So indeed, I I think uh, so as I was shown that that's a uh, important. The, the, we were very interested, for example, for cohesion. Those are the adhesion structures cells use to, to for example, connect themselves to, to the actual cell space. It, indeed, there's a molecular level picture. For example, catch slip bond. There's a catch slip bond, for example, it turns out many, many of the molecular players involved in the system, you have, we're talking about integrins, we are talking about acting, we are talking about, there's a lot of associate proteins, for example, even paxillin or vinculin, those are for cohesion proteins. Many of them involved in mediating the full cohesion dynamics, they have this catch slip bond behaviors. Yeah. And they many of them will mediate, for example, the cellular response. Uh, I'm talking about, for example, the full cohesion reinforcement or the acting structure, their dynamic uh, remodeling. Uh, they will they'll be involved in, in mediating this, uh, this cell stretch mediate cell response. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, the, 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 you, what, then you are talking about tissue folding. If you're talking about the, the last part, like this neural activator during tissue folding, then you are, we are talking, uh, that's the next level of challenge. So right now, in fact, our research, the last part is the modeling part is still uh, two-dimensional. But indeed, I didn't include the data. Now we are moving into 3D. Because indeed, uh, if you're talking about human early embryo development, we are talking about three-dimensional behavior, cell behavior, right? You are talking about tissue folding in 3D, hollow structures, tubular structures. We're moving towards that direction, and we have a lot of exciting results. I, I think, uh, yeah, things will get more exciting in the next few years. You made um, the point that your system with the micro uh, pillars, um, and your ability to stretch then the underlying membrane allowed you to apply forces without altering the, yeah, um, yeah, the geometry, the geometry, changing that interface, yeah, you know, yeah, just surface, in, yeah. you know, in inducing displacements on yeah, the interface. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know of sort of biological examples where that <laughs> distinction is is actually important in terms of you know, because I imagine these focal adhesions actually you know as they transduce the the force, they probably are deforming, right? So mm -hmm. um, I well, guess I I'm wondering what, you know, if there are biological examples where that distinction is really, re really important. critical or, or if we're still sort of looking for those. Not, not necessarily, I wouldn't put as one distinct advantage provided by a system. I would just make sure that, that uh, like, to, to, uh, to, to stress, that, not necessarily stress, clarify that there's that crit critical difference. Because if, I don't mention that. I don't think that people can easily see that difference. Yeah, but indeed, I think uh, that difference itself is um, uh, it's important to clarify because you can easily uh, we can also argue that easily expect that when you directly strain the focal cohesion, right? For example, then the in, uh, the, the, um, the the you can imagine that the inter the, the intermolecular molecular space, right? You're, you're, directly strain the focal cohesion, integrating molecules, that itself likely will have significant effect. But in all case, I, I feel that our system provide a simpler mechanical perturbation. Basically, right, it's, it's directly a force. You're basically just applying a force without changing that, directly impacting the morphology. Yeah. So, so just a quick question to build on that, if I'm understanding this correctly. That's a real, really cool talk. Um, so, so you, these are mostly, this is all focused on single cells, right? So individual cells 
right? Mm -hmm. So have you considered, you know, collections of cells on these same sort of micropillars and how perturbations to one of those cells might affect the conformations and mechanical properties of the other cells? Well, these are great questions that, yeah, should be started. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, we, we have not specifically looking into that question, but uh, yeah. It's, it, it's always a thing, right? You know, you, you, you're, this is so impressive, and then it's like, well, what are you doing the, the next big thing, right? You but know? I do think we have the right tool, right? One of the, the, uh, the ATC, the cost prison cytometry, allow us to perturb the cells locally. If, for example, within a monolayer of cells, uh, if we, for example, we loaded the bubbles locally, and in fact, we can do that, and we can locally perturb one cell or a small group of cells to see how that perturbation transmitted. Propagates, yeah. Propagates, yeah. And in fact, yeah, I think likely, in fact, uh, questions like that can be very important related to, for example, development of biology or defects, right? First defect, like defects of development. Yeah, this local event. Cool. Any, uh, any more questions? All right, well, well thank you again. Oh, thank you. Yeah.